basically, I started hanging with guys in the neighborhood there. One guy introduced me to uh, uh, sniffing inhalants at the age of nine. Of course, I knew, I did not know any better. Like, what is this? And uh, that was my uh, first encounter with a, the beginning of an addiction. Okay, George, so tell me about your dad. Well, my dad, basically, uh, I really never got to meet him. You know, only the the few things that I do remember uh, that he was a, an engineer and uh, a musician at night. So basically, I understand, stayed pretty busy, you know, uh, by doing his uh, construction road work and got off at the evening and music time. You know, he was a composer, guitar player, composer. Had a 35 piece band in uh, Miguel Aleman, Mexico. And uh, from what I remember, he was always smiling, happy, just a happy go lucky guy, you know. I remember the time I was probably four years old, uh, playing in the mud, water, a little water puddle. And he was just looking out the door with his arms crossed across one of those swinging doors, just smiling like, look at him, just having fun, you know? And those are basically the things I remember. And then I remember maybe by weeks later, everybody gathering there. I didn't know what was going on, you know? I looked over there and there was my dad laying on his back like he's sleeping. To me, he's sleeping. And my uh, aunt come up to me and asked me, why aren't you crying? I said, well, cry, or what do I cry about, you know? He said, well, your father passed. And I had no idea of what death was or, or anything. To me, he was just sleeping. And uh, soon after that, we moved to Houston. You know, I was born in Mission, Texas. Uh, all uh, my brothers and sisters were born here, one in Dallas. And, Houston. So um, my upbringing here, basically uh, at an early age, I'd say by the time at nine years old, you know, I started following guys older than me. It's like, I need to learn something. I had, now I realize I had no dad. And a mother with five was uh, pretty hard on her, I guess. You know, to discipline us, she'd call my uncle. Oh, no, don't do that, because I know what he's coming for. He's coming with a belt. <laughs> so um, basically, I started hanging with guys in the neighborhood there. One guy introduced me to uh, uh, sniffing inhalants at the age of nine. Of course, I knew I did not know any better. Like, what is this? And... Uh, that was my uh, first encounter with a, the beginning of an addiction. I didn't know anything. You know, I'm a, just a little kid, innocent. So because, would you say that because you didn't have a father, you were just trying to fill that void or look for that example somewhere? That's, that's true. You know, I needed some kind of someone to follow. And I didn't know I was choosing the wrong people to follow. From that first person that I followed, uh, you know, I encountered other of, of his friends, and everybody was in the same thing, his close friends. You know, to me, that's basically what I was looking for, somebody to guide me, because everything I was doing was wrong. And then it started becoming kind of fun for me, you know like jumping on the back of the ice cream truck, riding it for three or four or five blocks, you know. <laughs> Got a heavy whooping for that one. So because you didn't have that father, you were just looking to fill that void and somehow, some way, and whatever older guy happened to come along that sounded good, you were just like, okay, I'm, I'll follow him or we'll try to figure this thing out with him. Yes, uh, basically that's what it was because uh, that was the guy I hung up, hung up uh, excuse me, hung out with the most, you know. 
We interviewed a girl, a lady one time that wrote, had written a lot of books. I just want to see what you think about this. She said that if a young boy grows up without a father, he'll find some man and try that on and see if it fits, see if it makes sense for them. Was Does that make sense to you? What do you think? Yes, it, it, it made, makes a lot of sense because basically that's what I was looking for, you know, that fill that empty void, you know. Well, all these other guys got dads. I don't, you know. And I need, you know, be taught something, you know, uh, baseball. I couldn't do the baseball deal. Uh, couldn't do the Boy Scout deal because uh, my mom claimed I would probably drown in the river, you know. And just uh, things, you know. Parents back then weren't uh, too educated on any signs of problems. Uh, what they call now ADD, well, that was me, because through the years, through reading books, I said, oh, that's me, waiting to the last minute and being very adventurous and, you know. How how did growing up without a father, uh, how did that impact your life? And, uh, the impact was pretty hard. You know, especially watching other kids, you know, going places with their dad, holding their hands and stuff, things like that. Those are the things that I missed. You know, I saw the kids uh, smiling, happy, got their dad, and holding hands with their dad. Me, I have nobody but this skid row <laughs> at the time that I was learning all these bad things, all these bad habits, you know. Did that make you angry, you think, or little not um, was it was it frustrating was it disappointing angry no not 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 so much uh, I uh was just kind of I guess in a way you know just what in the hell father at the time but the funny thing about it when my mom finally met met this man um uh, Next thing you know, I heard they got married. You know, this was probably by the age of 11. I said, oh, no, I ain't liking this one bit. You know, if it ain't dad, it ain't nobody, you know. But uh, this man turned out to be the greatest man in the world. You know, uh, I remember later on at uh, a later age, uh, we worked together. And I asked him a question. I said, why don't you ever discipline us? See, that's what we need in our life, too. I never had discipline. Uh, and he claimed that we, we weren't his sons. He's never had a son of his own. And felt that wasn't his right to discipline us by us not being his children. And I explained to him, that's where you're wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> because we all need guidance, discipline. We need corrections. And after we had that talk, because, uh, you know, we, we didn't talk much at all. But after that talk, me and him had, and I was probably at the age 16, 17. But it was already too late. But you knew even as a teenager, uh, what's interesting in that concept is, um, and you hear experts talk about it, but children want to want to have boundaries. They that's part of you knowing that they care. Does that make sense? Yeah. As a father, we know that our dads care when they set boundaries and when they do discipline us in that weird sort of way. You know what I mean? Yeah. At the time, you may not understand it, but yet we do. We want those boundaries because that shows us that you care. That's was that something? I mean, is that is that what was kind of taking place in that conversation? You were like, wow. Why don't you discipline us? What's going on? I, I felt that's what it, you know, was because, you know, without a discipline, we just go our way. And, you know, <clears throat> he wasn't uh, disciplining us for the fact that, like I said, he, well, you all are not my children. I said, yes, we are, you know. Yes, at first I didn't like it. But then it kind of grew on me, you know, having another father, you know, 
So, uh, let me ask you, uh, as far as that man is concerned, uh, what are the good things you learned from him? I learned, uh, how to work. Uh, of course, I've always liked to work. Uh, early, at the age of 13, uh, I was walking up, probably traveling a good <clears throat> three miles shining shoes, you know, at an early age, up down Harrisburg, Navigation, uh, Canal Street. And, uh, and I, I learned from, from, at an early age, how good money was. You know, thirty-five dollars a night was a lot of money at at nineteen sixty-nine. You know, so. So you learned a good work ethic. I learned a good work ethic from him. He had his own business. I remember when he married my mom. He was a a laborer, a dollar fifty an hour. And within five years, he had his own business, and I kind of started working with him, learning the brick lane trade except towards the end he just uh, gave it all up at a later age uh, <clears throat> but some of the things that I learned from him was uh, the work ethics uh, and uh, love because he cared so much for us that we couldn't understand why a man that is not our father, would literally go out of his way for us and don't let nobody speak bad about us because he would get hot, <laughs> ready to set somebody on fire, you know. So I started learning then that dad, this guy really cares, you know. He's a stepdad, but he treats us like his own children now. But I believe after that talk we had, you know, he finally said, oh, okay, this is what they want. And he started, you know, disciplining us towards the end there. And um, so I, I did learn a lot from him, you know. Tell me a little of your story as far as um, how you got to the place of incarceration and kind of just along those lines, how you got into whatever it is that led to that. Give me a little bit of your background. Well, at the beginning, uh, at the age of uh, 15 again, following the wrong people it's always always the wrong people you know uh i got with a with a crowd at the age of 15 16 and then i was introduced it's no longer inhalants it was uh eating lsd uh at the age of 15 and within months of trying my first hit of lsd uh, start injecting cocaine on uh, heroin at the very, very early age of 15. So uh, these were the things I was learning because no guidance of a father, you know. And by the time, my, like I said, my mother had remarried, it was too late. I was an addiction, you know, already. And it was a good feeling to me. You know, now I'm starting to feel, well, now it doesn't feel so bad you know, not having my real father around anymore. You know, all the pain is going away. But I realize that the pain never goes away. You know, I just kind of camouflage it for a while. Yeah, but. So to that point, um, that, was the, that was the huge impact in that there was maybe an anger or a wound or this sadness or abandonment that you were dealing with as a result of your dad not being there. Yes, I believe uh, it all comes down to not having a father figure. And because my stepfather, for a while, felt he didn't have the right to discipline us. And you know, I do remember going fishing with him a couple of times. It was too late then. I was already in my addictions. You know? So the fact that now that I'm using drugs, uh, my first incarceration was... Uh, breaking into a drugstore. I want more and plenty more. You know, It didn't work out. 
I was caught inside the, the drugstore and terribly slammed from one wall to the other because these officers had no idea of my age or what I was capable of, or whether I had any weapons or not. So first thing saying, let's slap them. So that was the beginning of my going to jail at uh, the very early age. You know. I was still in high, junior high then. So all these feelings are all were building up. And I remember here at the, uh, during school, when they started zoning. Oh God, that was, it was kind of good in a way. And, because now you can no longer go to what school you wanted to go to. You go to the school in your area. Right. And uh, at that day, uh, there was a, a young girl being chased by five guys. And I intervened by, uh, you know, rendering help to her. The guys got so mad that uh, they told me they were going to be uh, waiting at the end of school for me. And I go, wow, all five of them? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I thought about it. Lunchtime came around, caught a bus home, went and uh, got my dad's 38. And I came back to school. And sure enough, at the end of school, there they were at the corner waiting for me. So I had no choice. I had to pass by them in order to catch my bus. And I, uh, as soon as I passed by one, I, I heard one of them say, hey, you know, you can't walk through that yard because actually I just cut for, to not walk out in front of them. I said, if I'm going to walk by them, let me walk behind them. So I kept walking. But anyway, the first guy that put his hand on my shoulder, and I turned around and stuck 38 under his neck. And I don't know what kept me from uh, pulling the trigger. Maybe him pleading for me not to kill him. And at that moment, there was a plainclothes officers patrolling because they knew there was going to be some rioting going on. So I actually just ran, threw the gun and ran, and I was caught. So also, for that wrong choice I, I made, I was barred from every school in HISD district. I could no longer go to school at all at the age of 17. So that was a lot harder on me not being able to get any education because my parents just couldn't up and leave the state just for, to put me in school. They just bought the house. So now here I have to choose what, what do I do now? That's what I know how to work. So at an early age, I started working, but still in my addictions. You know, it was uh, very hard on me. And sometimes uh, I see how hard it was with no education, but uh, until I probably get my GED, and I've come so close to it, and something always happens. And, uh, yeah, I believe it, it all boils down to not having that father figure. You know, I was just straying away, straying away. My brother's playing in the yard. I'm playing one block away. And as I was getting older, from one block to five blocks to one mile to three miles, and first one to leave home to another state at the age of 21. So always looking. You know, it's like um, there's something missing. There's always something missing, regardless of but if I had a job making good money, there was always something missing. If you could, uh, to your father, if you could say one thing to your father right now, what would it be? That I loved him very much, and I miss him. And I wish he was here, but you know, that's impossible. You are our father yourself, right? That's correct. Let me ask you this. What's the best thing about being a father? Their love. 
Now, I, <clears throat> I missed all my, like I have one daughter and two sons. I missed them growing up because of my addictions, you know. And they're there for me now, but it took a very long time. How do you think that's impacted their life? Pretty hard. And I've, I've dealt with uh, my daughter, <clears throat> her telling me one day when I was up in Wisconsin uh, at a dinner we had, she said, Dad, I remember, I remember you calling me. I was uh, two years old. And I remember this. And she goes, I, she said, oh, you're up there with Santa Claus because, you know, the snow and the cold. I said, yes, I'm up here with Santa Claus. She said, Dad, I used to sit on the porch and wait for you to come home. And that just, like, broke my heart. And the fact that uh, my absence, you know, and at first it hurt for her to call another man dad. But I had to realize that man was there for her. And I was not. So I had to understand the fact that this was also a great man for her, for my daughter. Because he stuck with her and he's still sticking with her. And I have no regrets on that because she does have a, a good upbringing. And that I, I, I thank her mother and stepfather for that. Uh, it's still a, still a little hard. We're still working on our bond. You know, with this last incarceration, uh, oh, there he goes again. And uh, here for a couple of times, she wouldn't even answer my calls. She would answer my text messages. And it uh, got to where she wouldn't even answer the text messages. And I'm going, whoa, you know. I said, I don't blame her because here I go again. You know, we were building a great bond. I mean, it was getting so good that this last incarceration just broke her heart again. And she's an adult now. But it did break her heart, I'm sure. How long have you been, how long have you spent in, in uh, were you in prison or jail or both? I've been in all. <clears throat> I'll be 12 years of my life that I've spent incarcerated. Different occasions, uh, been Prison four times, yeah, you know, four times. And I remember this last evaluation I got with one of the state doctors. Uh, she asked me while I was why I was still getting in trouble at my age. And I told her, I don't know. You're the doctor, and you find out maybe you can explain it to me why. <laughs> you got no answer on that one. And again, and again, she brought the fact that, well, usually it's a loss of a family member like your dad or sexually molested. Those things seem to drive people to drinking and drugging. You know? So it's always a pain of it. But I realize if, if you hold everything in, it just gets worse. You, know? you have to share what's going on in, with your life, you know. Two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. What, and this can be as it relates to your stepfather or your dad, what do you wish he would have done differently? My stepdad? Yeah. Discipline us at an early age. Definitely discipline us. You know, we all need correction. doesn't matter what age we are. I still need corrections, you know. How about if you had a friend who was going to be a father for the first time, what advice would you give them? Be prepared. It's not an easy task. Uh, and it's not just all about sex. You know, a lot goes with marriage. You have to be ready to step up to the plate. <clears throat> Be the husband you're supposed to be. And also, you know, be the son you're supposed to be, the brother you're supposed to be. 
And I would also say, talk to your children, talk to your kids, talk to your boy, especially your daughter. Fathers should talk to their daughters. It's their job. Because kids these days, and always, all they want is be heard. They just want to be heard. And they want love. Hug your child at least once a day. And if you have a toddler, hey, when you come home from work, instead of grabbing the remote, or even if you're at the TV with your remote and your newspaper, listen, all it takes is five minutes a day. Take that toddler and bounce him up and down on your knees. Five minutes, that's all it takes. Set him back down, and he's got his cup full. And he's always going to remember that. It's like a book I read, Dr. Vincent Peale stated that in Africa, they never had a delinquency problem. Of course, kids, uh, children were kidnapped and brainwashed to use weapons and kill and destroy. But they had never had a delinquency problem for the fact that all babies were carried in pouches up until the age of two. Whether there was a mother or the father or the uncle dues, papa dues, uh, even the children. And I'm sure you've seen kids carrying babies in tote sacks, the sacks they use. But what that shows that child, the warmness of the body, it shows that child a lot of love, that warmness. It's like I always say, would you rather receive a hug or ask for one? So you fathers out there, be the man you're supposed to be. Step up to the plate. Uh, 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 what I wanted to say as far as, uh, you know, you guys incarcerated uh, behind those walls, TDCJ system. Listen, talk to the young guys in there, you know. Uh, tell them what it's about, you know, how, how you being incarcerated as for me, I, I lost respect for my children. Everything's good now because I, I, I never gave up. You know, just keep calling them, keep calling them. Hey, Dad, can I call you back? Uh, call them back, you know. I always say never give up. And, uh, you know, what hurt me when I was incarcerated, my ex-wife telling me that, you know, your, when your son was in school, and through your absence, in school, he used to tell people he did not have a dad. That his dad had passed away because during meetings, uh, PTA meetings and everything, how they asked the kids, hey, what does your dad do for work? Well, he didn't want to lie, and he didn't want to expose me. And so, uh, you know, I was, I was out there. I was dealing, dealing drugs, pretty heavy. And he felt the best thing to do is just say, I don't have a dad. And uh, it, hurt me, it hurt, hurt me real bad to know that my son was telling people he had no dad. And now he hugs me every day, calls me dad. He'll call me up because everything's all good now to the grace of God that I never gave up, you know, staying in touch. So. And I encourage you guys uh, in TDC system, they have curriculums going on it's called Ca uh, Maximize Manhood. And it will open your eyes up. And it will teach you to be the father you're supposed to be. And I'll say it's never too late. Never give up on your children. Always call them and keep calling and keep calling. And eventually they will give in and it'll all be good. Watch the Father Effect movie for free on YouTube.